So, uh, hi everyone. Welcome to our tutorial titled Assessing Research Impact by Leveraging Open Scholarly Knowledge Graphs. So, my name is Dimitris Zaharidis and I'm a professor of data science and data engineering at the Université Libre de Bruxelles in Belgium. Together with my colleagues Elias and Thanasis, we will present this tutorial in three parts. The first part is the introduction that contains some motivation and history behind open scholarly knowledge and research impact assessment. Progress in science is best described by the metaphor standing on the shoulders of giants that was popularized by Isaac Newton. Scholarly communication is the process by which scientific results are made available to peer scholars. This primarily involves the publication of scientific articles, the so-called papers. As the volume of scientific output increases, the quest to find the most valuable publications becomes more and more challenging. There are two key problems that need to be solved. The first is discovery of publications, and the second is the assessment of the quality or of the impact of publications. Assuming that for, for the first problem, to some extent, there exist satisfying solutions, this tutorial will focus on the second. But first, I would like to talk briefly about discovering scholarly knowledge. Articles are disseminated by publishers. They have the complete control over this process, which they monetize. We say that papers, including information about them, are placed in isolated publisher silos. To discover them, there are different options. Traditionally, one can directly refer to the publisher who maintains a collection of books and journal series organized along scientific topics. Of course, the issue is that you manually have to consider different publishers in order to discover the knowledge you're looking for. The second option is to refer to citation indices, which collect article information across publishers and is often carefully curated for quality. As we will talk next, citation indices are maintained by large publishers and are available to research institutions at large member fees. Most recently, the third option is to use academic web search engines, such as Google Scholar, that thank to information retrieval and machine learning can scrape useful information from the web. The canonical example of citation indices is the Web of Science by Clarivate Analytics. Web of Science is based on the pioneering work done by Eugene Garfield in the 60s to construct and analyze a science citation index. The core collection of Web Science is a manually curated, highly selective index of the most prestigious publication venues. Another well-known citation index is Scopus, offered by Elsevier. Similar to Web of Science, it is a highly selective index that adheres to the standards defined by an external committee. The aforementioned citation indices and their like have been instrumental for the communication and progress of science. However, the growth rate of the number of published research is constantly increasing. Finding what one wants becomes harder and harder. Moreover, several studies suggest that among the vast number of published works, many are of questionable quality or low impact. Therefore, identifying most valuable publications for any given research topic has become a tedious and time-consuming task. So why do we experience such a growth? Well, simply the number of research is growing, the competition is increasing, and there is immense pressure for researchers, particularly young ones, to publish more as to distinguish themselves. This phenomenon is known as publish or perish. The increasing numbers of scientific output create the needs for methods that assess the impact of publications. 
The predominant indication of impact is the number of citations or the citation count of a paper. Academic search engines combine keyword-based search with a scientific impact measures, such as citation counts, to rank publications. The question, of course, is from what data do we seek to assess uh, impact? To assess research impact, we need to better understand the entire and capture the entire life cycle of scholarly communications. What we might see is just the publications, but there are additional information associated with them, such as grants, publication venues, data sets, citations, patents. Take as an example this tutorial, which is linked to some textual information, its title and its abstract, as well as to information about the presenters, the authors and their affiliations, and to the venue. More importantly, the references within an article construct a citation network that connects not just the articles themselves, but the other actors as well. For example, the institutions, conference and journal series, funding agencies, data sets, and other artifacts. Citation networks are paramount in assessing the impact of a publication, but also the impact of institutions and research areas, as we will see in more detail in part B of this tutorial. For impact assessment, the metadata about the publications are important. Traditionally, they remain locked behind publishers' silos. But recently, there are open science initiatives like I4OC, the Initiative for Open Citations, that help make the metadata publicly available. An important step to towards this direction was the adoption of the digital object identifiers by publishers and the use of Crossref as an overseeing organization that allows publishers to register their joys and link their references to other publishers' articles. The initiative for open citations led to a sharing tier within Crossref that provided open references. Building upon the information provided in Crossref, there are several other services uh, that provide additional data. Uh, one of these is uh, dimensions included here. Also, open scholarly knowledge graphs are built upon uh, this information in Crossref, and they are based on linked open data semantic web uh, data technologies to provide the means to share and uh, data across uh, interested parties. The most important among them is the Microsoft Academic Graph or MAG that seeks to replicate the success that Google Scholar has. Uh, Microsoft Academic Graph uh, uses machine learning uh, techniques to parse the web content and identify the different uh, actors. However, at the end of the previous year, MAG was retired. In its place, there are upcoming initiatives such as Open Alex, and we invite you to hear more about them in tomorrow's workshop on scientific knowledge, representation, discovery, and assessment, SciK, where we will have dedicated keynotes on the topic and a very interesting panel on the future of open scholarly knowledge graphs. When using such metadata to assess the impact, one must consider how good they are. Metadata providers have often different focus, they use different sources and tools, and thus the resulting data sets um, vary greatly in coverage and quality. So we might see that the carefully created uh, indices of uh, Scopus and Web of Science focus on quality, whereas Google's uh, 
Google Scholar and Microsoft Academic uh, of, uh, focus predominantly on coverage. So how do you uh, assess impacts? Well, even if you assume that the metadata has sufficient quality, there are many issues such as biases and pitfalls to consider when we are assessing uh, the impact. One of these uh, pitfalls is that the scientific impact has by itself various aspects. It would be an oversimplification to rely on a single impact measure like most academic search engines do. There are many diverse aspects of scientific impact and each one may be more appropriate in different scenarios. So, for example, there is uh, the case of an experienced researcher looking for a particular topic or a student making a survey. A survey. They clearly have different intents and they cannot be served by uh, probably the same impact metric. Also, impact is not directly related to scientific merit. Merit and quality could be something uh, different and uh, impact could be just one indicator of that. Another pitfall is the so-called Goodhart's Campbell's Law. So when you have a single measure and that measure becomes your target, it ceases to become a good measure. So we should not measure scientific impact by a single or a limited set of measures, but we should investigate a wider range of impacts and report them. So, for example, when we're using academic search engines, uh, not only the citation count should be, um, uh, should be mentioned, but other uh, metrics so as to better understand the potential impact of this, of the linked papers. Uh, the last uh, pitfall is that there's no uh, uh, proper interpretation of the impact measures. So there are uh, multiple impact measures and they can be used essentially to tell a different story. So the landscape is quite confusing and often uh, the measures are not properly used to convey the right uh, aspects. So with this, I would like to conclude uh, the first part and I would like to hand off for the second part uh, to Elias. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dimitris. Can everybody see my screen? I hope so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. So my name is Elias Canelos. I'm a, a research uh, assistant, a scientific associate at Athena Research Center in Athens. And in my part of the talk, um, we are going to uh, talk about approaches for, est for estimating the scientific impact with focus on papers. So here we leverage data of openly uh, uh, scholarly knowledge graph to calculate some estimation of uh, paper impact. I will uh, detail and classify the literature into various approaches, and then I will present some um, representative examples in each category. And at the conclusion of my talk, I will uh, briefly discuss some strengths and weaknesses of various approaches before I hand the microphone to my colleague Thanas. So as Dimitri has already said, nowadays we have a large availability of corpora of scientific papers and for practical reasons, such as reading prioritization, scientists need to assess the impact of papers in order to know what to read and what not to read and to discover what is of interest to them. And because of this uh, need, there is a large uh, literature on the subject of uh, assessing uh, the scientific impact of papers today. However, uh, as Dimitri said, there are different uh, approaches into how to measure impact. And, uh, and in the literature, we have uh, evaluations of uh, various methods uh, based on different uh, goals and evaluations that are performed on different data sets. So it is not always clear which impact assessment method should be used, which is the most appropriate in uh, under uh, every particular circumstance. 
So we have performed a survey of the literature on the subject and we found more than 32 methods back in, in 2019. And what we have uh, uh, recognized in the literature is that there is no particular uh, standard definition of uh, impact. Instead, the, the idea today is that it's defined in many different ways. And for example, here, we can see two different quality aspects of papers. Here, the slide depicts a graph of citations received per year by two papers on the same subject. We can say that the older one has been foundational. It's been around for a longer time and it receives a maybe a total amount of citation that is uh, larger than the set of one. However, uh, the second one, while it starts with a fewer citation than the first one, in its year of publication, we can see that uh, just a few years afterwards, it gathers a very large amount of citations, which we consider to reflect its actual popularity uh, at the time of its publication, taking into account that a paper receives citation only after other papers are published that cite it. So since there are uh, lots of different impact aspects that can be quantified and expressed, uh, we have to see how the literature treats this, uh, this problem. And in the literature, we find that uh, impact assessment is usually expressed uh, as a ranking problem. So for example, as Dimitri already said, we have the well-established citation count, which is a score that is assigned to papers in a collection. And it, uh, it is used in order to comparatively assess the relative impact of papers to each other. So we can express uh, the impact assessment problem as a problem of ranking. So the citation count itself is nothing uh, more than the in degree of the nodes in a graph where nodes are papers and uh, edges, directed edges are references. And consequently, this is simply a network centrality measure that can be used as an impact proxy. Uh, and hence, much of the literature on the subject uses various analysis on such graphs of paper to calculate scores, which are used as impact proxies. So since the literature uh, focuses on citation graphs, let's uh, have a, a few basic definitions. So a citation graph or a citation network is a graph that has nodes that represent papers and directed edges between them, which represent references. In such a graph, we expect the edges to have a kind of temporal relation uh, in the sense that newer papers can only cite older ones. So references in a way point backwards in time, and we do not expect to encounter any cycles in such a graph. Mathematically, we can represent a citation network by a citation matrix. Uh, a citation matrix A is an N by N matrix where N is the number of papers in our network. And each cell in this matrix has a value equal to one, to one if the paper represented by column J cites the paper represented in row I. So in our first column in the example graph that I give you in the slide, for example, paper A cites papers B, C, and D. So the values of the, of the uh, the first column in rows two to four are one. And otherwise, the citation matrix has a value of zero in all its cells. And another handy uh, representation of this network that is used by network analysis methods is the so-called stochastic matrix S. And this is simply derived by the citation matrix if we divide each non-zero value by the sum of ones in the particular column. So for example, for A, which cites three papers, B, C, and D, instead of a one, we would have the value one third. So this is essentially dividing these values here by the number of references that paper A makes. And in addition here, in contrast to the citation matrix, is that for papers such as E, which do not cite any other ones, we artificially insert edges towards all papers and towards itself as well. So the last column, instead of being filled with zeros, has a value of one divided by five, where five is the number of my nodes in the sample network. So since we have the mathematical representation of a network, how do we define some common centralities which are modified in the literature? 
The first one is the de facto measure used, the citation count, which is simply given by the sum of the ones in a row that represents a particular paper. So for example, in our sample graph here, we have paper C, which is cited by A and D, and this can be uh, calculated by adding the ones in the highlighted row. Another common centrality that is encountered in the literature and is used, uh, is modified to express uh, various uh, different impact aspects is page rank. And page rank was a, a method that was developed in the early days of the web in order to rank web pages based on the links between them. And it has since been applied on citation graphs where nodes are papers and instead of links, we have references. The idea of page rank is that is expressed by the motto that a high impact paper is cited by other high impact papers. And this is expressed by the equation given in the left hand side of the slide. Uh, essentially, each paper receives part of a score of its citing papers. Uh, and in fact, a uh, score is divided equally among all references. Uh, this this um, score is added by all citing papers and multiplied by probability alpha, which has a value of zero to one. And to that, we add one minus alpha divided by the number of nodes. For example, for paper C, we have a third of uh, A's page rank score and half of D's page rank score since D cites two other papers and one fifth of E's page rank score since we have added artificial edges from E to all other uh, nodes. And to that, we add one minus alpha divided by one fifth. So in essence, this equation uh, models the behavior of an entity, which we call the random surfer. Or in our case, when we talk about citation networks, we can call it the random researcher. And the idea that is expressed here in the first part of the equation is that we have a person that starts reading papers at random, and after reading a paper I, uh, they choose either paper uh, that is found in the reference list with equal probability, and this behavior happens alpha percent of the time, and then with probability one minus alpha, so one minus alpha percent of the time, this entity chooses any paper in, in the collection at random. So this method has had some early applications since 2007 in the works of Chen and Ma and many other works since then. And this equation essentially um, um, defines an iterative relation that can be calculated for all papers. So these two centralities, citation count and page rank, are uh, most often at the focus of uh, methods in the literature that try to assess scientific impact. And depending on the particular problem that is defined each time, different modifications are applied to them uh, in order to solve each problem. Uh, some example problems are given in the slide here. A common idea is that citation count is too democratic and we should differentiate between citations depending on which papers make them. Uh, one idea here, apart from applying network analysis methods such as PageRank, is to use weights, uh, weights on citations, for example, based on the venue of the citing paper or its authors. Uh, another uh, common problem, Dimitris already told about this, uh, told you about this, is the fact that uh, methods that analyze citation networks can be biased against recent papers since older uh, publications have had more time to um, gather citations. And the idea here is to insert some uh, time aware quantities in the calculations or to apply uh, rescalings of calculated scores. Another problem concerns the, uh, the topic of malicious manipulations. For example, we can have cliques of researchers who cite each other without any particular reason, just to increase the, their citation counts. And here, the various ideas that can be employed are, uh, for example, discounting the weight of self-citations or to quantify some kind of uh, similarity between papers and then uh, count the citations from papers to similar ones, consider them as the important ones, and uh, neglect the other ones as being incidental. So these are just a few of the problems in the literature. 
And of course, there are many others. And depending on the problem that is defined each time, different uh, approaches are used to overcome it. Uh, in our own work, we have found more than 30 methods, as I said, you can see them in brief in this uh, table, which you can find in our paper referenced at the bottom of the slide. Here we categorize the methods we found in the literature based on the types of data they use and their computational model. So in the following, I will classify them first based on the uh, types of data they use. And here we have methods that only depend on citations, such as the traditional uh, uh, metrics we already saw. Then we have methods that uh, apply calculations using paper metadata that can concern venues, publication venues, or the authors of papers. And of course, there are other options here, such as uh, pub uh, publication topics or the institutions that uh, produce the publication. And another important type of data that we found in the literature are time-based weights that concern uh, either paper age, uh, when a paper was published, citation age, which concerns when a paper was cited, or the so-called citation gap, which quantifies how much time passed from a paper's publication until its citation. The other axis based on which we can classify uh, the approaches in the literature concerns their underlying computational model. And in the following, I will present some characteristic examples uh, in each of these categories. Uh, the first one concerns uh, applications of uh, citation counts that are modified. The second uh, family concerns modifications of page rank based models. The third concerns analysis on heterogeneous network. Uh, another type of uh, method is called ensemble methods, which uh, combine various different scores in an arbitrary way. And then there are a number of approaches that do not fall into any of the above categorization. So citation count-based methods uh, simply apply weights on citations, which can differ for each paper. In the example here, for example, uh, the citations made by paper A have a different weight W compared to all other citations by other papers. And one such method in the literature is called weighted citation. Here, the idea is that we have two types of indication of a paper's prestige based on which the, the weight of a citation should be uh, adjusted. The first one of these uh, is the so-called article influence score, which depends on the publication journal of a citing paper. And this is in turn a function of a journal's eigenfactor, which in turn is a page rank type measure calculated on a graph of uh, venues instead of papers. Um, the second uh, quantity that is uh, considered important as conveying prestige is the quote unquote quickness of a citation. Here, uh, the authors consider that uh, a quick citation means that a particular paper has uh, shown an important breakthrough and hence it is quickly noticed by other works which cited, or it is written by some estimated authority in a field which raises its trust by other scientists in order to cite it. So here, uh, the quantity used is citation gap and the time passed from a paper's publication and the citation. And this is passed as an input to an exponentially decreasing function. And the exact parameters of this function are always determined based on the empirical distribution found in a data set, which shows the uh, number of citations made by each paper to other papers published n years prior. This here, this, this exponential fitting here the methodology is very common among methods that use exponentially decreasing weights based on publication dates. So taking all of this into account, weighted citation simply modifies the citation matrix A, and instead of ones, it inserts in it the products of the article influence scores times the, the exponentially decreasing uh, quantity. So for paper C, for example, we add the citations of uh, paper A and D, weighted by their article influence score and their respective uh, time-based quantity. 
Another approach that uses time-based quantities uh, based on citation counts is called the retained adjacency matrix. And here, the idea is that uh, a citation carries less importance it will, if it was made in the past. So to calculate such a modified citation count, the method derives a matrix called R, uh, where instead of the ones in our citation matrix, a quantity gamma is used, which is a number in the range zero to one. And this is raised to the power that depends on the time difference between now and the date that a paper was uh, did make a citation. So here simply, instead of adding the ones, we add uh, uh, discounted uh, values depending on how long ago a citation was received. I will quickly mention here an extension which is called ECM. And here the idea is to use the RAM matrix but instead of only calculating direct citations, we also add uh, citation chains of any length. So for paper C, we would have the direct citations given from papers A and D, and we would add to that uh, a, a weight depending on uh, two hop paths, for example, here from A to D and from D to C, which is always attenuated by a factor alpha in the range zero to one. So this is essentially counts for all papers. The, the number of paths uh, of citations that lead to a particular paper, which are weighted based on the length of the path and how long ago each citation was made. And this idea is uh, in reality, a modification of another centrality measure called the cut centrality. And with this example, I will close the, the the literature examples uh, on modifications of citation counts, and I will proceed into the details of methods that modify page rank to quantify scientific impact. So uh, if you recall, as I said earlier, the, the page rank uh, models two types of behaviors of a random surfer. One is highlighted in the orange box here, and it says that a random uh, researcher chooses any paper in the reference list as his next reading with equal probability. And then in the green box, we see that with equal probability, a researcher might choose any paper in the network. So modifications uh, in PageRank's model consider modifying either one or both of these two behaviors. So either uh, a, a researcher is modeled to not follow all references with equal probability, or he's, he's modeled to not choose any paper at random when he restarts a random walk. So in order to better understand how to engineer a PageRank-based method, we have to better understand how PageRank works. So recall at each uh, point, when, when a random researcher reads a paper PI, his next choice only depends on his current paper. So this can be modeled by a finite state discrete Markov chain, which has a um, transition matrix G, G from Google, the values of which equal alpha times stochastic matrix S. And to that we add one minus alpha divided by the number of nodes times matrix J, where the matrix J has uh, all ones, all of his elements ones. And if we look at page rank this way, then its calculation satisfies the, the green box, even at the right hand slide, uh, that right hand hand of the slide. And this expresses the idea that page rank values are the values of a stationary distribution of a matrix G. And to calculate these uh, values, we use a so-called power iteration, which is shown in the orange box. So we apply the multiplication of this matrix to the page rank vector iteratively until our scores converge. So if we want to create our own matrix, let's say G prime instead of G, what we have to ensure is that this, uh, the, this power iteration in the orange box will converge. And to satisfy uh, convergence uh, conditions, we have the peron frobenius theorem, which states that any such matrix will converge if it is uh, stochastic, uh, which by definition is true for G. And it also has to be irreducible and aperiodic, which are both conditions that are satisfied uh, when we have 
all states um, having a possible transition to all other states. And this again is by definition true since we have added the factor one minus alpha divided by N in all cells of our Google matrix. So in order to engineer a page rank based method, what, what we have to do is uh, modify our stochastic matrix S, let's call it S prime, as long as we keep it stochastic. So each column has to have values that sum to one. And here, instead of one divided by the number of references of each paper, we can use different types of weights. And the other way to temper with page rank is to change its random jump behavior when we choose any paper at random and instead define our own function, which we can call the custom jump vector, as long as we normalize it so that all values in our modified Google matrix sum to one in, in each column. And if we apply <clears throat> such interventions, then we can easily translate our result to a particular quote unquote wildcard researcher behavior. And with that, I will, I will detail some of the uh, methods in the literature that apply such modifications. The first one is called focused page rank. And it was developed with the aim to provide a measure that is something between uh, a page rank and citation count. And here, the idea is to modify the behavior of the random researcher so that instead of choosing any paper in the reference list with equal probability, they prefer the papers that are more highly cited. So instead of having one divided by K in each non-zero entry of our stochastic matrix S, we have the fraction of total citations of all the cited papers uh, in this column. For example, for paper C here, uh, it receives a citation from paper A. A in turn cites papers B, C, and D for a total of four citations. Two of them go to paper C. So paper C receives two fourths of uh, paper A's page rank. Paper D in turn cites paper C and E, which in total have two citations. So paper C receives two fifths of paper D's page rank, and so on. With the random jump part of the equation being identical to the one used in vanilla page rank. So the idea here is that a random researcher prefers uh, among the reference papers the ones that are more visible due to more citations. Uh, another very popular modification of page rank is called site rank, and this uh, follows the assumption that a researcher will start browsing papers from recently published ones because they either encountered them in a, a recent issue of the journals they read, or they saw an interesting work in a conference they recently attended. So this method, uh, instead of using a uniform probability in the random jump part of page rank, it defines a quantity row, which is an exponentially decreasing function of each paper's age. And if this quantity is normalized so that it sums to one over all papers in the network, then the original uh, equation given in Citrans paper can be rewritten uh, in the form given at the bottom of the slide. And here the first part is identical to page rank. Any random researcher chooses any paper in the reference list at random, but when they randomly choose any other paper to start that is not one found in the reference list, then they do prefer the ones that are more recently published. So a random researcher would restart his walk rather from A than from B and D, rather from B and D than from C, and so on. And the final example is our own method, which we call ATRANK. Uh, our aim was to capture current research trends and to do this, we use the idea of preferential attachment. So preferential attachment is a network growth model proposed by Barabasi, which states that in any graph, uh, any node will uh, receive incoming edges from new nodes that enter the network with a probability that is proportional to the incoming edges they already have. And if we applied this uh, idea as is, then we would only succeed in uh, advantaging the papers that are older and already have gathered a large number of citations. Uh, instead, our idea was to restrict the calculation of this probability uh, based on the citation distributions 
of the Y most recent years. So our own method has three parts. Here, the first one is identical to that of PageRank. We have a random researcher who with probability alpha, after reading a paper, chooses a next one with equal probability from uh, the reference list. Then with probability beta, the random researcher restarts by choosing any of uh, the papers that have been recently cited. And then with probability gamma, we have also applied the factor that is similar to CiteRank. A random researcher will restart his work uh, by preferring the papers that are recently published. And by keeping A alpha plus beta plus gamma equal to one, we can guarantee convergence. Okay, uh, with this example, I will move on to the methods that um, analyze heterogeneous networks. So a heterogeneous network is a network that contains uh, nodes which represent different types of entities. And the edges between these entities represent different types of relations. For example, in a scholarly knowledge graph, we can have nodes that represent authors and nodes that represent papers and edges between them can uh, represent the fact that author A writes paper B. Uh, many methods in this category uh, were inspired by HITS, which was an early contender of PageRank in the early years of the web. And the idea is to apply mutual reinforcement from different types of nodes. That is, each type of node transfers parts of its score to other types of nodes and vice versa. And in this way, many of the methods that uh, analyze heterogeneous networks to, to assess impact can, at the same time, not only rank papers, but also authors, venues, or maybe other types of entities involved. One such example is a method called PRank. Uh, this method was developed with the idea that uh, citations should be differentiated based on the citing paper, on a citing paper's authors, and a citing paper's venues. And this method proceeds in three steps. Uh, first, it calculates author scores as the sum of the scores of their author papers. Then it performs the same uh, calculations on venues. Each venue uh, receives a score that's equal to the sum of its published papers scores. And then the method defines a page rank like um, equation. Again, the first part is identical to page rank. And then the second part, which defines the random jump, is further divided, divided into two probabilities, B and C, where probability B of selecting a paper depends on, its, uh, on the scores of its uh, authors and the probability of selecting a paper C depends on the score of uh, the venue that publishes it. In each, uh, in, in each type of uh, probability here, the scores of authors and venues are uh, normalized based on their total number of papers. And this method is then uh, repeated until convergence. So for example, for paper C, we have here the first part identical to page rank. And here we have my one minus alpha times B, um, the sum of uh, author one and author two's scores divided by two and three, because author one writes two papers and author two writes three papers plus C times the score of venue one, which publishes paper C divided by three, since it has three published papers. And this method is repeated until convergence. Uh, another popular method of this type is called future rank. Here, this method was developed with the goal of predicting page rank scores in a graph that consists only of citations that appear in a future time point. And the authors use three ideas here. One of them uh, derives from, from the empirical distribution again, that they found that each paper cites uh, mostly papers published one or two years prior. So again, they fit an exponential function to this empirical distribution. Uh, the second idea is to apply the principle of page rank. And the third idea is to apply mutual reinforcement. So good authors, are considered to write good papers and good papers are considered to be written by good researchers. So this method defines another uh, matrix, another network matrix. 
uh, which uh, represents authorship relations. Uh, this is called the authorship matrix M and each column represents a paper uh, J and each row represents an author I and the values of this uh, matrix are equal to one whenever paper J is written by author I and zero otherwise. So these ideas are quantified in these two sets of equations, which are repeated until the author and paper scores converge. The first equation simply calculates author scores as the sum of their, uh, the scores of their authored papers. And then the second equation, which calculates scores for papers has three parts. The first one is identical again to the first part of PageRank with coefficient uh, alpha. Then with coefficient beta, we add a score to each paper, which depends on the scores of its authors. And then with coefficient gamma, we add to that a score that depends on the exponentially decreasing function of each paper's age. Uh, these are the two most popular methods in this category. And with that, I move on to ensemble-based methods. Uh, the idea of ensemble methods is to calculate various different scores and then aggregate them through some kind of operator. And many methods in this category were proposed in the KDD Cup of 2016, which had the challenge of uh, ranking scientific papers based on some uh, ground truth set provided by relative rankings of pairs of papers by a set of experts. So here I will present the the winner of this uh, this KDD Cup 2016. Uh, this method uh, applies calculations on various bipartite graphs, uh, calculates different scores based on this calculation, and then uh, aggregates them in some way. In, in particular, the method starts by initializing each paper score uh, as a linear combination of uh, the papers in and out degree. And then it transfers this paper to other papers, authors, and venues. In fact, all papers receive an average score of their citing papers. All authors receive the average score of their authored papers. And all venues receive the average score of the papers they published. Then in a second step, the scores of authors are further refined. The idea here is to use information about the venues where they publish in. In fact, for each author, uh, we calculate the average of the scores of the venues they published in. So for example, for the middle author here, we have both venues, we take the average. And this in turn is used to calculate an average with, uh, with the score previously calculated from papers. This now is a, a score A prime, which is considered as their refined author score. And then having the scores of authors, venues, and papers, we again go back to papers and uh, define three types of scores. One is the score received by the average scores of citing papers. One is the score received as the average of each paper's uh, author scores. And one is the score received by each paper by the score of its uh, publishing venue. And uh, these three scores are compared to the one that was initially calculated. And the, the group that is greater or lower than, uh, than this value is determined and is used, is considered as a more representative one. So for example, let's, uh, let's assume here that paper C has received the score from its citing papers and from its authors that is higher than the originally calculated score, while the score that, he, that, that the paper received from its publishing venue is lower. Then we would choose the two ones uh, the two scores that are greater than the initial score, we would average them and the result, we would use the result to average it with the initial score that we calculated at the phase of initialization. And in this way, we could calculate new scores for all papers, which we can then input into another iteration of the same procedure, uh, which the method repeats for a number of four or five times. So finally, there is a number of methods that do not fit into any of the above approaches. And the most characteristic example of that is the so-called H rescale page rank. Uh, this method was developed uh, to avoid the, the age bias uh, that exists in simple page rank without, however, using time-based weights. 
So the idea here is that for any uh, paper of reference, we determine a, an interval, a delta p, uh, which uh, includes the most closely published in time papers with reference to paper i. And using this collection of papers, we can calculate the average and the standard deviation uh, in order to then compute the so-called z-score, which is given in the equation at the, at the left-hand side of the slide. So the z-score is simply the page rank score minus the average divided by the standard deviation. And the idea here is that if we get an R value that's less than zero, we consider a paper to underperform in terms of page rank compared to its contemporary papers. And if the value of the recalculated score is larger than zero, then the paper is considered to overperform. Again, this method has uh, various extensions. For example, instead of only uh, selecting papers based on how closely in time they have been uh, published to a paper of reference, we could also uh, restrict this um, set to papers that belong to the same field. Okay, so at this part, I will uh, conclude the, the examples in the literature and I will briefly discuss a few strengths and weaknesses of the various methods. So a first important strength concerns semantics. As Dimitri said in his part of the talk, many times it's not easy to explain what a method, uh, what, what a particular uh, impact aspect conveys. So here in the case of page rank based models, we have an easy translatable uh, behavior of a researcher into the natural language, uh, which makes it easier to understand what this course represents. So any page rank based method actually describes the probability of finding a paper under a particular uh, behavior model. And this semantics um, other types of methods do lack the semantics, so it's not always easy to explain uh, the results. Another uh, strength uh, of methods that do not use metadata is their viability. Again, as Dimitris already said, uh, there are large amounts of data that require cleaning. So, uh, for example, Although we may have many sources of, uh, of uh, metadata for papers, such as uh, um, their authors and their venues, uh, these data are not easy to use. For example, many authors may appear with uh, different uh, names, uh, for example, by using or avoiding the use of a middle name, or many authors who are different may, may have the same exact name, so it's different to differentiate between them. And similar problems exist in the case of uh, the use of publication venues, where particular venues may appear uh, with different names, uh, for example, using a full string or some type of abbreviation. So although metadata-based methods seem to be useful, their actual viability is questionable depending on the, on the quality of the provided data. A uh, different type of strength of, in, uh, of strengths and weaknesses that I would like to discuss quickly here. It concerns the time bias that is inherent in, in traditional methods of impact assessment. And there is a large uh, literature that places importance on predicting, quote unquote, rankings that result from citation counts or page rank when we examine a future graph. So the idea in such types of evaluation is to run a ranking method on a, a data set that is split based on a particular time point, let's call it TS. Uh, and then taking this citation network up to TS, papers are ranked based on a particular method. And then two types of ground truth rankings are defined, uh, either by, by using all citations from uh, the beginning of the citation network until after time point TS and running page rank or uh, citation count on that set. And this is considered as a ground truth of uh, the influence, the ground truth ranking of influence. The other approach is to only use future citations after point TS, which gives us a ranking which we can consider as the ground truth for uh, popularity. And in our work, we have uh, examined the correlations of such rankings in both scenarios. We implemented the number of methods 
And in the case of ranking based on popularity, we have found that the current literature has some margin of improvement, as we can see in our graphs here. The best correlation we achieve is close to 0 0.6, while the, the perfect agreement would be a 1. From our results, we found that in the scenario of ranking based on popularity, the methods that perform best are those that take into consideration citation age. However, we know that their weak point is that they cannot distinguish between papers that have zero citations at their time of publication. The second best uh, models, the second best models are those that take into account paper age. But again, here the problem is that they overgeneralize. All papers that are published at the same uh, in the same year are not differentiated. And on the other hand, we found methods that make use of metadata or citation gap to not be as effective. Uh, in contrast, in the scenario of ranking based on influence, we found that traditional methods perform fairly well. Here we can see that the best correlations are close to one. So the margin of improvement is not as high. And here we found that time-based methods, methods based on metadata and other computational models, again, do not have any particular benefit compared to the established ones like citation count and page rank. So at this point, my part of the talk comes to an end. Here I have included some further reading on the topic for anyone who's interested. And here are our own relevant works, our survey on paper ranking and our own method, as well as a number of applications uh, of, of these uh, ideas, which now my colleague Thanasis is going to talk about in, uh, in more detail. So from my part, thank you. And Thanasis, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Leah. Give me a second to share my screen. Okay. Um, so, um, hello, uh, I am Thanas Vergulis. I am scientific associate at Athena Research Center in Greece. And uh, uh, I will guide you through a couple of uh, uh, applications uh, uh, regarding uh, the techniques uh, that uh, uh, were presented in the previous uh, part. Uh, so uh, the first thing I would like to say uh, is that uh, modern research assessment is becoming possible simply due to the availability of open scholarly, scholarly data, and in particular, open scholarly knowledge graphs. Uh, these graphs are catalyzing research assessment applications. Before them, uh, both the coverage and the quality of scholarly data was extremely low, making it impossible to rely on them. Uh, but due to the popularity of open science initiatives uh, in the recent years, for example, the initiative for the open citations or the initiative for the open abstracts, uh, a large amount of scholarly data have become available uh, facilitating the calculation of impact indicators uh, and hence uh, enabling research assessment applications. Uh, is the coverage and quality ideal? No, uh, we will talk about this later on. But at least in many disciplines, the open scholarly data are in a pretty good shape and we expect for them to improve even more in the next years. Now, uh, together, we will go through a couple of indicative application areas for the impact estimation approaches presented in the previous part. Um, as you can see, although our focus was on methods to estimate the scientific impact of publications, since publications are very central, a very central piece of research output, uh, uh, the available applications are not restricted around publication assessment. The same techniques uh, can be found useful in other contexts as well, for example, assessing the performance of individual researchers. In any case, we are going to briefly examine three application scenarios. The first one is about literature reading prioritization, uh, which is uh, more or less the most traditional or at least among the most traditional application areas for scientific impact indicators. In this scenario, 
we leverage impact measures to prioritize reading in a field of interest. Uh, for instance, combining uh, impact measures uh, with keyword relevant scores to rank relevant publications. The second scenario is about using uh, the impact measures of a researcher's publications uh, to estimate their academic uh, performance. Uh, finally, uh, the last scenario is about taking advantage of impact measures and topic modeling techniques to identify research topics which have att attracted a lot of interest, a lot of attention lately, and hence have a lot of potential. Uh, okay, let's examine the concept for the first application. Uh, as we have mentioned in the first part, uh, nowadays, delving into a particular field of interest can be extremely tedious. This is because due to the publisher Paris trend, there is an extremely large number of published research works and the number of publications is increasing in an, in an intense rate. Uh, to make matters worse, various studies have shown that a significant portion of these published works can be of low interest or even of low quality. It is evident that due to this situation, any mechanism that could help researchers prioritize which works to read would be extremely helpful. As an additional issue, uh, what is more important is not the same for all types of users. Recall the example of two individuals interested in the same field. Uh, the one being an experienced researcher wanting, wanting to find out about the latest trends and the second one being a student wanting to delve into the same field to create a survey. It is evident that different publications may be valuable for each of one, each of them. Uh, the first one uh, needs to identify current pop currently popular publications, for instance, leveraging an indicator like the Atron. Uh, the second one needs to identify publications that have shaped the field during the whole history of, of it. Uh, hence, PageRank, for example, could be uh, a better match. Uh, but in both cases, an impact-based publication ranking ranker could be could be instrumental for the identification of the publications which are more likely to be uh, the most valuable ones. Uh, this is more or less the idea behind BeFinder, a prototype academic uh, search engine uh, we have created in the past and which can be found available in the link uh, presented in this slide. The users uh, can provide a set of uh, query uh, keywords and can select uh, uh, from a set of ranking criteria, uh, some of which are based on impact indicators like AdRank, PageRank, etc. These scores are also combined with keywords uh, with keyword relevance uh, based on the title and the abstract of the papers to bring uh, in, the, in the first page of results papers which are at the same time important and relevant to the determined keywords. Uh, the system uses icons with a color code to indicate how popular uh, or how influential is each of the results. In addition, the users can leverage a variety of filters to tailor their searches even more. Finally, additional functionalities like paper comparison and uh, saving papers in reading lists, in custom made reading lists, uh, are provided as well. In general, the vision behind uh, BigFinder uh, is to provide a set of, of, of services and resources to offer a multi-dimensional view of publications impact. Towards this vision, apart from the BigFinder service itself, uh, we also provide a variety of open resources like the BigDB, which is an open uh, dataset uh, containing pre-calculated uh, impact uh, scores uh, for a lot of, for millions of uh, publications. And the BIP API, uh, that is an open API, uh, that uh, gives access to the same uh, data uh, in a programmatic way. Uh, the BIP Ranker is a library uh, written in Spark uh, that uh, implements the calculations and uh, anyone can 
uh, use this library. It is an open source library uh, to perform the same calculations uh, in their own uh, citation network. And finally, we have uh, some other uh, resources, for example, the bit for COVID-19 dataset uh, that contains uh, similar uh, scores uh, for um, the publications that are relevant to coronaviruses and uh, COVID-19. Uh, in particular, this late uh, uh, resource it is very popular and uh, it has uh, more than uh, 31,000 uh, downloads right now uh, in the node. Uh, you can find uh, two relevant publications, one uh, in the site uh, workshop uh, co-hosted with uh, the web conference of last year and another one in CIKM of 2019, if you want to delve into uh, the details of this uh, ecosystem. Now, uh, let's go to the next indicative application scenario. Um, advancements in the career of researcher, uh, such as rec rec recruitment, uh, promotion, etc., uh, and professional achievements, uh, for instance, awarding prizes uh, or funds, uh, essentially rely on some type of uh, performance assessment uh, for researchers. Ideally, uh, this involves uh, scrutinizing uh, the CVs of the researchers of interest and uh, of their competitors, if this applies. Uh, however, nowadays, this process uh, can be extremely tedious due to the extremely pro ex 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 uh, extensive productivity uh, of modern researchers. Uh, driven by uh, the shifting nature of the scientific paradigm and by uh, the intense uh, competition among them, a notorious trend uh, uh, known as publish or perish, as was mentioned in part A as well. Consequently, in an attempt to reduce the burden, evaluators turn uh, to the use of uh, the so-called evaluation shortcuts, uh, which are indicators such as the number of papers, the impact factor of the journals uh, where they publish, uh, the citations, etc. Uh, however, uh, relying on these uh, evaluation shortcuts uh, can be the source of many problems. Uh, they can amplify uh, important problems like math effect and even foster bad practices in research. Uh, they fail to capture the full spectrum of uh, aspects of research impact uh, because a very limited uh, number of uh, indicators are used. Uh, they are oblivious of various types of research activities, for example, the creation of data sets of uh, research software, workflows, or even practicing open uh, science. Uh, and also uh, they can be oblivious of different contribution roles. Uh, finally, uh, as also Dimitri said, uh, it is very easy to have misconceptions uh, about the interpretation uh, of uh, the indicators, creating even more, uh, even, even larger problems. Uh, detailed impact indicators can help in some of these problems. Uh, for example, uh, capturing a, a, a better uh, picture, a more complete picture about uh, the aspects of research impact. Uh, so here comes uh, another prototype uh, uh, that uh, we have built, uh, BIP uh, Scholar, uh, which uh, aggregates uh, indicators uh, capturing distinct uh, aspects of scientific impact, but not also impact. Uh, also other aspects like uh, productivity, open science practice, career states, etc. Uh, it provides details uh, on how these indicators are calculated, on which data they are calculated, which are the proper uh, interpretations, uh, which are uh, some uh, possible misuses of it, uh, so that people can avoid them. Um, and uh, as I said, uh, we are not restricted uh, on impact here. Uh, we also provide some additional indicators for other types of activity, for example, for the creation of data sets, and we plan to add even more such examples. Uh, and uh, we try to also adopt uh, contemporary uh, practices for the responsible research assessment. Uh, 
uh, the researchers have the option to uh, curate their own profiles uh, based on the orchid profiles they have. They can synchronize them, link them uh, with uh, the Big Scholar page and uh, bring all relevant uh, works uh, there. And they also have the option to add additional metadata that are absent from uh, ORCID, uh, like uh, the contribution roles they have based on the credit taxonomy uh, in each of these works uh, and uh, the respective topics uh, of the works. So uh, a more detailed um, a uh, profile page can be uh, created. Uh, this is a very recent work and uh, will be presented in more detail uh, in this year's uh, JCPL International Conference on Digital Libraries. Finally, uh, the third uh, application scenario uh, is uh, the, the third application area is uh, about monitoring trends in research topics. I will cover this uh, more quickly in the interest of time. Um, in in, in um, uh, general, let's say that we have officers in RFOs, in research funding organizations, and uh, these officers want to, to plan uh, for the next uh, uh, funding uh, frameworks, uh, which will be the topics to be funded. Uh, so uh, they already know, for example, some interesting topics, some of them that uh, have, already, ha have already received a lot of funding, uh, but they also want, uh, for example, to identify uh, new uh, interesting research topics that uh, uh, they have not uh, received uh, much uh, funding uh, until now. So a possible way to facilitate their work towards this uh, mission is uh, to apply uh, topic modeling techniques on the available literature of the last years identify a couple of topics uh, and then uh, use an impact aggregator uh, to try to identify uh, the uh, aggregated impact of each of these topics. Uh, this will give them the opportunity to, to create, uh, to, to have, an, uh, have insights about uh, the trends in research topics. And then uh, they can see if some of the topics that are uh, really interesting in the last years uh, should receive more funding, for example. So uh, this could be uh, just an instrument, uh, an additional instrument in this direction. Uh, closing these application areas, uh, let's see uh, as a final step, uh, which are the open challenges regarding what we have discussed until now. Uh, we can for, uh, foresee two types of uh, uh, challenges, of open challenges. Uh, the one is about the data availability, quality, and coverage in open uh, scholarly knowledge graphs. And the other one is about improvements in the indicators themselves. So uh, in the context of the first, first category, uh, it is uh, well known that uh, knowledge graph metadata uh, need to be enriched and cleaned. Uh, uh, of course, uh, as we said, uh, due to uh, the open science uh, initiatives, we already have uh, an increased, a significantly increased quality and coverage of uh, scholarly data. However, uh, we are uh, uh, far away from having uh, uh, so something 100% uh, concrete for all the categories. For example, it is known that uh, fields of study are absent uh, for most papers in most of these uh, graphs. So this could be uh, uh, an interesting challenge, for example, for uh, automated or semi-automated methods to provide this type of information. Uh, also, uh, also uh, as uh, both Dimitris and uh, Elias, I think, mentioned, uh, disambiguation of authors or venue names uh, is, al is also important because some of this uh, information comes from different uh, uh, sources and the same entities uh, may be named uh, slight in a slightly different way, making it difficult uh, to, to identify uh, to, to clean this type of data. So this is another challenge that uh, needs to be uh, addressed. Uh, also, 
uh, the full text of uh, uh, the papers are not uh, available. Uh, we have a large uh, volume of outputs that are currently uh, full open uh, open access, uh, but uh, there are not all of them uh, open. Uh, of course, uh, this is a very complex uh, issue, uh, but at least, uh, for example, uh, in, a, in a form, uh, for example, in the form of an inverted index, uh, at least uh, uh, the important uh, uh, aspect, uh, uh, the, the important subject uh, discussed in each of uh, the texts could be available in some form, for example, uh, Microsoft Academic Graph was providing something like this uh, in its dataset. Uh, regarding the indicators themselves, uh, we think that uh, the field is an important factor that should be uh, uh, considered. And uh, although there are some uh, works uh, towards this direction, uh, for example, there are indexes like uh, the field weighted citation index that try to, to capture this uh, information. Uh, however, uh, all these indicators are based on uh, very simplistic uh, um, in indicators like the citation count uh, without considering uh, the most the more uh, complex uh, uh, perspective like those that were presented in part B of this uh, presentation. Um, also, uh, all this work uh, it has been focused on publications, uh, but uh, as we all know, uh, this is not the only uh, type of research output. Uh, there are others uh, like datasets, uh, software, etc., that are uh, of equal importance. And uh, all these have connections uh, to publications, and it is a really interesting uh, subject to study uh, these connections and uh, try to identify proper ways uh, to propagate uh, impact scores uh, to these other types of research output to have uh, indicators for their uh, uh, impact as well. And uh, finally, uh, another interesting uh, subject that uh, we have identified is uh, regarding uh, methods uh, that uh, try to, to, to reveal uh, semantics uh, for citations. Uh, we all know that citations are made uh, for different reasons. And of course, uh, we in, in this type of analysis, uh, in research assessment analysis, we use citations as proxies of impact, uh, but this is not the case for all the citations. Uh, so uh, although there are methods uh, that uh, provide this type of information, uh, semantics of these citations, until now uh, we don't have uh, a very uh, concrete way to combine uh, these semantics uh, with modern uh, techniques uh, like those presented in part B. So this is an also interesting topic, how it is uh, the proper way to combine uh, semantics uh, of citations uh, with these indexes so that uh, you avoid, for example, use uh, as proxy citations that are uh, irrelevant, uh, like uh, coincidental uh, citations uh, uh, or things like that. So uh, closing, uh, I, I try to be brief, but of course uh, we can have a, a more detailed discussion in the Q&A uh, section of this uh, um, session. Uh, however, uh, let me, as Dimitri said, let me also uh, emphasize that uh, uh, tomorrow there is a relevant uh, workshop that we are co-organizing, uh, the PsyK workshop. Uh, you can find uh, more details about it, its interesting program uh, in the link presented in this slide. Uh, we have very interesting keynotes uh, by Alex Wade uh, from Somatic Scholar and uh, uh, Jason Priam uh, for Open Alex about the next day after uh, uh, the mug uh, discontinuation. So uh, stay tuned and uh, uh, go to um, uh, to attend this, uh, we think, very interesting uh, workshop. And uh, at this stage, I would like to thank all of you 
uh, for your interest in our tutorial and uh, for uh, attending it. Uh, here you can find also our contact details, uh, our emails and our uh, Twitter um, uh, IDs. Uh, so if you are interested, if you have any questions, of course, uh, we will be available offline to discuss anything uh, that they, is interesting to you. However, if you have any questions right now, we will be more than happy uh, to answer them. Thank you again. So I don't know if we have any questions in the chat. I cannot see anything. Okay, so if we don't have any questions, uh, I don't know, uh, Jenny, uh, can can we? Uh, Yes, we we'll just Consider end the session if there is no question. Thank you for the mm -hmm. presentation. It was very interesting. Okay. So thank you again. And uh, if there are any questions offline, we will be happy to answer them. You can find our details in that slide. Thank you very much.